So type A people, for example, they walk fast. If you, if you start going for a walk with these people, after two blocks, you think you're in a foot race. <laughs> these are people who talk fast. And by the way, if you're a slow talker, they'll finish sentences for you. <laughs> they eat quickly. These are people who inhale their food. We had a doctor at our hospital, used to go through the cafeteria line, load up his tray with food, and by the time he got to the cash register, his tray was empty. <laughs> His idea of a relaxing meal was when there was a long line at the cash register. You know, oh, good, I can relax today. You know, one day we invited him to come and sit down. It was a whole new experience for this guy. These are people who drive quickly, and they time everything very tightly. You know, if it takes 20 minutes to get somewhere, and they have to have, a, have an appointment or a meeting or something, they plan to leave 20 minutes ahead. But if they're ready 25 minutes ahead, They'll find, find something to do for five minutes. They don't want to leave early because they might get there early and then waste five minutes. So they'll return a phone call, they'll riffle through their email or something like that. And then they look down at their watch and now they're running a few minutes late. Now it's a quarter to the hour. And so they ramp up into what I call type A travel mode. This is where they get on the left lane of the highway. They speed, they honk, they weed lanes, they tailgate, anything to make up time. And they get, as I say, they get very impatient as well. And there's a wonderful Herman cartoon that shows a guy getting into a taxi, but he's getting into the driver's door. And the driver's <laughs> looking up at him, and he says to him, I've got to be at the airport in three minutes. I'm driving. <laughs> it's a very type A thing to do. Most of our beliefs are subconscious. We're not even aware that we have them. And so they're more powerful because they're hidden. Let me illustrate this. Uh, with one of my favorite stories. And this was a, a story about a woman who came to see me years ago for a very early morning appointment. And she came just frazzled. I mean, she arrived in my office looking like this, and I said, boy, you look pretty stressed out. She said, I'm like this every morning. <laughs> and I said, why? She said, well, there's so many things I have to do from the time I wake up to the time I fly out the door to go to work. So I said, well, what are these things you have to do? Whenever I hear words like have to, should, must, need to, I know I'm hearing a belief. So I said to her, what are these things you have to do in the morning? Well, I have to get, get up, I have to get washed, I have to get dressed, I have to have breakfast, I have to make my bed, I have to get my kids up. I said, hold it a second. What do you mean you have to make your bed? Well, you have to make your bed, she said. Like, <laughs> duh. And I said to her, well, where is that written? I'm not sure that I've ever seen that. Was that the 11th commandment I missed? You know, where did you, where did you learn that? She said, my mother taught me that. But everybody knows that. And I said, well, I've lived in places in the world where people didn't make their bed. I don't think you have to make your bed every day. I think that's actually not a truth. That's a belief. That's your version of the truth. But I don't think that's some cosmic truth. And I explained to her what beliefs were. And I said to her, if you want to test this, why don't we do an experiment? Why don't you not make your bed for a week and just see what happens? Now she looked at me like I was really loopy, you know, <clears throat> and also recoiling a little, thinking that I probably didn't make my bed that morning either, you know. <laughs> now, this is a woman who was 54 years old and had been making her bed every day from the age of 12. Now, that's a very rigid behavior based on a very rigid belief, but that's the way she operated. Two weeks later, she came back, big grin on her face. She thanked me for the permission, and she said, I haven't made my bed since my last visit. <laughs> now, ordinarily, you would not applaud that, but I was pretty impressed. And she said, and nothing bad happened. And I said, wow, what a surprise. <laughs> and she said, it was kind of liberating to not have that pressure. And I said, well, I'm glad you had that experience. And she said, but you know what else? And to me, this was the real key to the story. She said, you know what else? I'm not drying my dishes anymore either. <laughs> so I looked at her and I said, who gave you permission to do that? <laughs>